Hello, hello, hello. You're listening to the Kinks and Beatles Daily Deep Dive. I'm your host, Tony Fry. Thanks for downloading episode 216. That's right, 216. If you are new to the show and you want to check out the 215 episodes we've talked about before this, swing by herohabit.com. At the top of the page, there's a podcast button. You will find a link to the main page for um, this podcast. And from there, you can see all the ways you can follow us on social media, all the previous episodes that we've done. And you can also uh, learn how to contribute five bucks, uh, either as a one-time gift or as a monthly contribution to help keep this podcast alive. I appreciate every uh, contribution that's come in so far. And if everybody that listens did it, I, uh, I don't know. I would appreciate it because that would be a lot, of, a lot of money. Anyway, speaking of money, today we're talking about the Money Go Round by the Kinks. This track was released on November 27th, 1970 as the final track on side one of Lola vs. Power Man and the Money Go Round Part 1. It is one of three titular songs on this album. The other two, of course, being Lola and Part 1. I kid. The song illustrates the amount of money other people make off of the kinks music despite not having anything really to do with it uh, and it also name checks several members of the kinks inner circle so you have the opening line robert gives half to grenville who in turn gives half to larry that's a reference to the band's three managers grenville collins robert Wace, and larry page why any band would want three managers is beyond me but in september 1963 while the kinks were still the bow evils Robert Wace actually wanted the band to be his backing band because he was an aspiring R&B singer who was managed by Grenville Collins. And in order to get uh, some better paying gigs, the band actually agreed with this arrangement. And what they did was they featured Wace on some songs at the end of their set. He usually went out and did four or five tunes at the end of the set. And that was their way to get these better gigs and whatnot. Um, later that same month, Waste manages to get Brian Epstein, who's the Beatles manager, over to listen to the band play. And supposedly, Epstein liked Ray Davies and thought of him as a solo act um, and wasn't really interested in the full band. But nothing came of any of it, not with the band or with Ray Davies as a soloist. But it makes you think what a difference it could have been had Epstein signed the Kinks. Uh, because he might have been able to get them signed by EMI and in... EMI studios, which were far superior to the studios at Decca or Pi or, you know, a lot of the other labels that were putting out uh, albums by like the Stones and the Animals and stuff and the Kinks. Uh, EMI had the superior sound quality and it would have been, it, it could have made a huge bit of difference, probably would have killed the remaining British invasion bands um, if you had two groups coming out with that caliber of recording quality saying nothing about this the fact that the kinks had superior songs to most of those bands anyway didn't happen so why are we talking about by the beginning of october remember we're we're talking september to october here uh, the band are now billed as robert wace and the bow weevils and they play a gig where wace gets booed by the crowd um so the bow weevils drop this additional singer formation for the more traditional one that we know and love And literally two weeks after this gig, Grenville convinces Robert to hang up his rock and roll shoes and they form a partnership to manage the band that will eventually become the Kinks. Keep in mind, over the last month and a half, Grenville and Wace have fronted the band for new outfits. They've booked them into better gigs. They've even purchased them some upgrades to their equipment. So despite the singing not working out, they seem to have had a pretty good working relationship early on. Um... And at the end of November 1963, Waste is shopping the band for a potential publishing deal when he's directed to Larry Page. Now, Page is a very recent co-founder of Kazaner Music. Um, I, I believe it was actually founded within a couple days of uh, Grenville and Robert making their partnership to become managers. So both of these are new ventures. But Page is uh, essentially just a scout for acquiring new talent. He has waived 
his share of the publishing fees to get basically finders fees and stuff um, for all these bands that he's that he's going to book. And incidentally, this company that he founded, Kasner Music, lasted until the nineties. So they they did pretty good for themselves. Um, so he likes the band and he agrees to a 10% management stake in the group. So the deal isn't signed until 1964, but for all intents and purposes, this is the beginning of their triple manager era is end of 1963 because uh, Larry Page doesn't wait to sign the contracts before he starts getting the guys, you know, uh, closer to that record contract. And so, I mean, it seems excessive, but looking at the sudden trajectory that the band was on once these men got involved with the business side of stuff, it's hard to argue the results. You know, Paige is the one that even encouraged Ray to focus on songwriting and his lead vocals because they were looking for a, a, a dedicated lead vocalist like the Stones had. And um, Kasner Music was actually trying to give them their own published songs, which isn't uncommon. If, if, you've, if you've got a publishing contract with somebody – they can give you those songs for free and they make all this money, uh, you know, off of the royalties off of it getting played on the radio and put out on the albums and stuff like that. But they didn't like any of those songs. They didn't want to do those songs. So, you know, Paige actually encourages them to start writing your own. But clearly by 1970, the massive money that had been spent on three managers, uh, two different management entities, but three people, you know, um, obviously rubbed Ray the wrong way. All of that to say that this opening verse is pretty loaded with frustration. Robert gives half to Grenville, who in turn gave half to Larry, who adored my instrumentals, so he gave half to a foreign publisher. He took half the money that was earned in some far distant land, gave that half to Larry, and I half, I end up with half of goodness knows what. It's a heck of an opening statement. Uh, I write the song, and the revenue from that song goes through all these people who take a cut for doing nothing, and I, the creator of that song, am left with the scraps. And it really should be the other way around. And you know, maybe I'm biased because I write songs, but it should be the other way around. The people that are creating the product should be making the first cuts. Um, this song has one of my favorite Davies lines. And uh, like a lot of my favorites, it's not so much what he's saying, but how the words fit with the melody. We talked a long time ago during the alcohol podcast about how much I adore the line, now the floozy's gone and found another sucker. And almost as high on the list for me is this line, I went to see a solicitor and the story was heard and the writs were served. That bit at the end, story was heard and the writs were served. The, the, rhythmic, the rhythm of it, the way the words work together, um, the way it works with the melody of the song, it's such a cool little, se- you know, second, two seconds of, of material, but every time, you know, and, and it's kind of like this uh, ascending line, the story was heard and the writs were served, ah, dun, 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 you know, it leads right into the next uh, verse or chorus or whatever you want to call the next section. Um, it's just a cool, it's just a cool little moment. And I like these little moments. Ray, more than anybody, squeezes these little moments in, I think, where it's like, well, that was the perfect collection of words. And they could be nonsense. It doesn't even need to really mean anything or be the most important part of the song. Uh, But it's the perfect words to flow with whatever else is going on in the music. As I've said several times now, this song is one of my favorites on the record. Uh, And for me, it's, it's too short. You know, it's clocks in at under two minutes and is among the shortest complete tracks the band ever released. So I'm not sure what could have been done to make it longer since it's kind of a perfect little gem as it is, but I always want this track to go on longer. It's just a fun little ditty. And even though it's kind of written in, performed in this uh, vaudeville kind of show tune way, there's a lot of like aggression in it. There's aggression in, in Ray's voice. There's aggression in the bass guitar. You know, the, it's just very like heavy, even though it's a very lighthearted little melody. It's a cool tune. If you haven't heard it, you need to listen to it. If you have heard it, I want to hear what you think about it. Give me a call at 925-494-1739 or email me at 
kinks and beats at herohabit.com. And like I said at the beginning of the show, go to herohabit.com and find all the information you want on this podcast. Join our subreddit, follow us on the Twitters, join our Facebook group, wherever you like to spend a little time on social media. Um, we should be there either as kinks and beats or as hero habit. All right. I will talk to you guys tomorrow and, um, thank you for listening. Make sure you like, and subscribe and, um, rate and review five stars for this podcast, wherever you're listening and tell all your kinks and Beatles friends. All right. Take care, everyone.